They told the doctor, hey, we're going to take care of her. She'll be fine. They took her back to the Fort Harrison, put her in a room, locked her up there for 17 days, where they put her on what Hubbard called the introspection rundown or baby watch, forced her meds down her. At one point, they, they used a turkey baster to uh, get her medications into her, the sedatives. Her condition was deteriorating fast. She started, you know, uh, barking like a dog, uh, thinking that she herself was L. Ron Hubbard. She was smearing her feces on the wall. I mean, it, it's heartbreaking to read this. And all the at the same time, you know, she's begging for help, and silence is all she got. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Welcome back to Change Agents, everyone, an Ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company. This week, we are going to be talking about Scientology, and my guest is Mark Bunker. Mark is an Emmy award-winning journalist, filmmaker, and the founder of Xenu TV. He is the vice mayor and councilman for Clearwater, Florida, their second district to be specific. This district is also a home base for the Church of Scientology, which owns much of the downtown. And he started Xenu TV in 1999 to expose allegations of deceptive and abusive practices by the Church of Scientology. He has been a contributor to HBO's film Going Clear, Scientology and the Prison of Belief, which is a documentary I cannot recommend enough. And he has been featured on the A&E show with Leah Remini, Scientology and the Aftermath. Hope you enjoy today's episode. Scientology is something that has interested me for a while. I actually hosted uh, Aaron Smith Levin on my personal podcast. So I had the chance to sit down and talk with him for a few hours. And what a fascinating inside look at an organization that uh, is shocking. In many ways, yeah. I guess would be a polite way to put it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, and, uh, you know, having grown up in that, Aaron has a unique perspective that, that I don't. I, I was never a member. I just found it fascinating and started um, looking into it more and more and then started speaking out. How, how did it first hit your radar? I mean, most, and I say that, and it's interesting that you found it at all. I found it through the uh, documentary. The first time I had ever actually really heard about it or paid attention was through the Going Clear documentary, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. yep. Before yep. that, though, hadn't hit my radar. I'm not uh, a religious person, not anti-religious, not really pro-religious, live your life, kind of do your thing. Aaron's perspective, and, and most of the time you hear people talking about Scientology is from people who have left the organization. They, are, they seem to be very deeply invested in providing information exposure and then helping people leave it's uncommon i have found to find people that were never actually part of the organization that have become as passionate about speaking out about it or out against it as you have been so i'm curious what led you down the uh, the rabbit hole into where you are now well i first found out about it from a documentary as well uh <laughs> you know an episode of 60 minutes way back in 1980 mike wallace came to clearwater to, uh, to do a report called the Clearwater Conspiracy, which was all about how Scientology snuck into town here back in 1975 and started buying up property under a fake name. And they set in motion a series of covert operations to take over the entire town, uh, destroy the mayor, uh, uh, you know, get people into the... Um, uh, local newspaper so they could report on every action the paper was reporting on. And it was fascinating. This was all uncovered a few years later, in, uh, around 78, I think, when the FBI raided Scientology's headquarters 
in Washington, D.C. and in L.A. And tens of thousands of documents were discovered that had everything in writing. Here's how we're going to uh, set up the mayor on a hit and run accident. Here's the author Paulette Cooper, who just wrote one of the first books about Scientology. Here's how we're going to either drive her insane and put her in asylum or get her arrested. And, and they actually set her up on a, uh, a bomb threat against the UN and against Henry Kissinger. And that really, really devastated her life because she was a journalist at the time, too. Uh, but suddenly she was in the papers as this terrorist, and it took her several years and all of her money to fight that, uh, that thing that Scientology had done. And then she was, she was finally cleared when the FBI uncovered uh, Project Freakout or Operation Freakout, which was what they were using to destroy her. So, I mean, this is fascinating. Uh, Mike Wallace came here at the end of that segment. Uh, Scientology had gathered an, uh, a, a table full of maybe four Scientologists to sit there and answer Mike's questions. And they couldn't, of course. They couldn't look at anything. Uh, Mike would say, are, are you troubled by these reports? Well, we wouldn't read that. No, that, you know, we would go to the church and ask them what happened. And that's def that def definitely didn't happen. Uh, and I found it fascinating. And yet at that point, there was no Internet. So you can't do any further research. Uh, there were very few books in the library, and, and I found none. Um, so it just was in the back of my mind. Uh, years later, I, I moved to L.A., and I was living in a home in the Hollywood Hills, and uh, apparently not too far from L. Ron Hubbard's last wife, who had gone to prison for all these covert operations in Project Snow White. Um, she had uh, lived just a few blocks away from me, uh, uh, apparently, and I, I wish I'd known I would have gone over and, you know, Knocked on knocked the door. On the door. Said, Hi. Sure. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but uh, uh, but I, the woman who had lived in this uh, place before me was a Scientologist. And she had left without giving them a forwarding address, which is not uncommon. Uh, there are people who, when they leave Scientology, they want to be off the radar. So I kept getting all of her junk mail, all the celebrity magazines and uh, all their other publications. And I would be reading through them, seeing ads for the e-meter, reading these articles by L. Ron Hubbard. And it was just wacky stuff. Uh, and so I started looking a little bit more into it. Uh, by that time, uh, there were some great books published, my favorite being Barefaced Messiah by Russell Miller, uh, which is a eminently readable biography of Hubbard that, that um, you know, it's, I think one of the best books out there for introducing people to the subject. And, it, it, you know, it goes through the history of, of Scientology and all the scandals. Um, and then I started going to the Scientology properties around town, pretending I knew nothing about it. And I just, you know, go into one of their orgs and say, what goes on in here? And they'd give me tours. Um, and I started going online and uh, talking to people on a popular news group at the time, if anyone remembers what news groups were, uh, Alt-Religion Scientology. And for the first year, I uh, created a, a pseudonym and uh, was too afraid to show my face. I would uh, post as Ben Wog. And then at some point, I uh, gave myself a doctorate in honor of Hubbard, uh, since he did the same thing. So uh, I became Dr. Ben Benjamin Wog. And uh, about a year later, I finally um, got the nerve to, to get involved. Uh, a man named Bob Minton, uh, along with Stacy Brooks, a former longtime member of Scientology, had taken over um, a... Um, a, a, a cult awareness group. It wasn't the Cult Awareness Network because Scientology actually sued that one, destroyed it 
bought all the all of uh, the cult awareness networks um, information and, and identity, and they now run it. But there was another one that Bob was uh, in charge of saving because that that one had been saved. Uh, that one had been sued as well, and homes were raided, including one guy who lived in my neighborhood when I was living in Glendale, California. Uh, so Bob announced that he was opening up, um, uh, you know, this uh, this revamped uh, uh, awareness group. And I emailed him and said, hey, listen, if there's anything I can do, I'd be happy to help. Uh, I've been putting video online at a time when really there was very little video. Uh, the only thing that was out there was real video to stream video. And the quality was horrible. Um, but it was something tiny little posted stamp size video that was pretty blurry. But I started uh, posting news stories like uh, that 60 Minutes piece and stories about the death of Lisa McPherson, a Scientologist here in uh, Clearwater, who had been held hostage uh, for 17 days uh, while she was did, enduring a mental can you, break. Can you Sorry. dig into that one a little bit? I think that's an important maybe sure. anchor for the conversation to uh, to illuminate a little bit the behavior of the church. Yeah, absolutely. So Lisa McPherson was a, a dedicated Scientologist. She was um, active here in Clearwater, Florida, uh, before I moved here in 2000. She died in 1995. I believe she had been a member for about 15 years and a devoted member who had uh, worked for a company run by Scientologists um, so her whole world, of course, as always happens when you're, you know, you get into Scientology, suddenly everyone around you are Scientologists and you start working with Scientologists and, and you know, uh, it, that, that becomes a very insulated universe. So she had had a mental breakdown at one point and she had had a minor car accident here, um, right right near the Fort Harrison Hotel, which is one that Scientology owns. And it was a minor fender bender. When the paramedics arrived on the scene, she had taken off all of her clothes and was walking down the street naked. And okay. the par paramedic came up to her and said, what are you doing? Uh, and, and Lisa said, I need somebody to pay attention to me. I need help. And they took her nearby to the Morton Plant Hospital, which is just a few blocks away from the Fort Harrison Hotel. And she was checked in there. Um, within an hour, uh, 10 Scientologists, including her boss uh, at that point, and some other folks that I encountered on the streets of Clearwater, um, who were always trying to handle me when I was out and about, these people showed up at Lisa's hospital room and convinced her to check herself out against the doctor's wishes. They told the doctor, hey, we're going to take care of her. She'll be fine. They took her back to the Fort Harrison, put her in a room, locked her up there for 17 days, where they put her on what Hubbard called the introspection rundown or baby watch. And this was this nonsense that Hubbard created to handle a psychotic break. Uh, the theory was uh, they need complete silence. Uh, so she was put in a room. She had some caretakers who would be watching over her, most of whom didn't even speak English. I met one of them just a few months ago who was assigned to this, didn't speak a word of English. Uh, but they were told to watch her, not respond to her. Um, and make sure that they, you know, forced her meds down her. At, at one point, they, they used a turkey baster to uh, get her medications into her, the sedatives. Uh, and they kept logs every day of her progress. And you could see in those logs, her condition was deteriorating fast. She started, you know, uh, barking like a dog, uh, thinking that she herself was L. Ron Hubbard. She was smearing her feces on the wall. I mean, it, it's heartbreaking to read this. 
at all the at the same time you know she's begging for help and silence is all she got finally uh, after 17 days her condition became so bad that they decided uh to instead of calling an ambulance of course they decided to throw her in the back of one of their vans and they drove her to a hospital but not the morton plant hospital a couple of blocks away no they drove 45 minutes to uh, another hospital where there was a Scientologist doctor on, on call. And when they showed up there, she was dead. And he, he was freaked out. What, 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 what are you doing? What, you know, he was supposedly monitoring her care and prescribing, you know, meds without seeing her. Um, so this uh, this was uncovered about a year after Lisa's death in 1995. One of my friends, Jeff Jacobson, I believe, uncovered this in the police uh, reports. And then it became a public story. And then this was a story that went around the world because our district attorney here in Florida charged uh, Scientology criminally in her death and a church had never been criminally charged before like this scientology fought back hard for years and managed to destroy that case by targeting uh the medical examiner and convincing her to change the cause of death from uh uh you know a, a something that that was brought on by Scientology to an accidental death. And at that point, the uh, the state attorney said, OK, well, we don't have a case anymore, so we're dropping it. But Scientology spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the top experts in the country on their side to be coming up with bogus reasons why they were not responsible for her death. Uh, they they hired uh, two of the top um, uh, pathologists that worked on O.J. Simpson's trial right before that. Um, and, you know, uh, once again, Scientology succeeded in quashing um, this court case, but they, they certainly didn't silence the story which went around the world. And there are people who still are aware of Lisa McPherson's death. Uh, there was also a civil case that my friend Bob Minton was funding. That was brought down too after the criminal case uh, died. Bob uh, was attacked so viciously, he eventually settled. Um, and with that, there was no more money to fund the civil case. So Scientology has always got away with murder. And it's it's shameful, it's shameful. But people continue to speak out, and that's the important thing because former members and folks who have never been a member, such as myself, continue to bring awareness to what Scientology has done and continues to do, and that has, you know, blossomed over the last several decades. So that now, uh, I think there are a lot of people who have a pretty solid general knowledge of Scientology and how they operate. So much so that late night comics like uh, like um, John Oliver and, and Steve, uh, Stephen Colbert can uh, make jokes about really inside information about Scientology that the audience understands. It's a, remarkable to me that, you know, the, the once mysterious OT3 level about Xenu, the intergalactic overlord, who uh, blew us all up in a volcano 75 million years ago, causing all of our problems, that's, that's OT3 on, on Scientology's bridge to total freedom. Normally it costs you about $360,000 to learn that. Now it's the butt of jokes. Uh, even the fact that David Miscavige uh, ban banished his wife from his site, and she's you know she's been off at a distant base 
um, uh, uh, you know, hidden away there. Where Shelley is now something that that uh, John Oliver can use as a punchline, uh, you know, many many times on his show. So it, it, it's it's great to see that you know the the work that folks like Aaron and others have done over the decades has has brought us to this point where it's harder and harder for Scientology to to get new members. And former members continue to leave. Problem is, there are still a lot of wealthy members in there. Scientology still has a lot of money, but uh, they're they're you know they're fading. Um, and yeah, it's kind of the Clearwater. It's the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no. Clearwater has kind of been their their. Um, you know, the place where they're circling the wagons to make a last stand. Do you know how they selected Clearwater in the first place? Why they chose that as to the place to put their anchor in the ground? Sure. Um, forgive me if I'm being so verbose with these answers. Oh, no. No, please. <laughs> uh, uh, back in 1968, uh, Hubbard was running... Scientology from England because the the um, FDA raided Scientology's headquarters here and seized all the e meters in '63 and uh, said that, that that he was practicing a medicine well on a license and caused legal problems there. So he left the U.S., went to England for a few years, uh, and then uh, he got uh, in trouble there and decided that he would buy a ship and run Scientology from international waters. And that was the birth of the Sea Org. And so for a few years, he and his ragtag crew of young Scientologists who had no experience uh, on board a ship suddenly um, were out at sea. Um, and after a few years of that, Hubbard said he wanted to come back to America. So there were two, uh, two cities that were finalists for him, uh, both because they had properties that were um, uh, something that, that he felt could be used. And, um, and the fact that Clearwater has the word clear in it mm. probably wasn't the, the deciding factor. But um, I think it was a factor in his choice for for moving here. Uh, and immediately he started uh, setting out to take over the town. How big is their infrastructure footprint in Clearwater right now? Well, they started out with two buildings, the historic Fort Harrison Hotel, which was the meeting place for for all of Clearwater, essentially where weddings and wedding receptions were held. And uh, and they also bought uh, an old bank building a few blocks away from it. Now they have been gobbling up everything they can. So they have a huge footprint. Even, you know, back in 2017, there was a story about how they purchased a certain property and they assured uh, the mayor at the time that that's it. That's all we're we're gonna buy. Uh, we're done. We've we've got our campus finished. Well, now they have secretly purchased up almost every remaining property downtown. Uh, for like a, I think they spent one hundred and thirteen million dollars on that, and they've left these buildings largely empty, um, using them as leverage against the city. And they've done the same thing more recently in our Marina District, which is adjacent to the downtown. And it's an area that we had have been planning to um, to renovate with a, a, um, a CRA, which is an area where, um, you know, the 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 rules for uh, building properties, building uh, apartments, businesses, such as that. Those are all um, 
uh, eased up so that developers will have a, you know, more of a reason to come and, and uh, fix up a blighted community. So we've been doing that downtown and now uh, we, we were just about to start one in the Marina district and Scientology has, has you know, uh, put their foot on the neck of that as well. So we'll see uh, how that goes, but it, it's, it's, it's really a difficult situation here. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more fired up to introduce the presenting sponsor for season two of Change Agents, Montana Knife Company, founded by somebody that I feel very fortunate to call a personal friend, Master Bladesmith, Josh Smith. Not only a Master Bladesmith, but the youngest Master Bladesmith and one of the most experienced in the world. Montana Knife Company blades are some of the finest that I've ever been able to get my hands on. They are the sharpest knife out of the box, and they're some of the easiest to resharpen when you dull the blade. I take them everywhere that I go. I have them in every vehicle that I own and every backpack that I ever take into the backcountry. Specifically, my favorite blade of theirs is the Speed Go. It's lightweight, but so incredibly capable. I never leave home without it. If you're familiar with Montana Knife Company, you know it is often very difficult to get one of their blades because they sell out within minutes of being released. What you should be able to find in stock are the Blackfoot 2.0, Speed Goat, or a Stonewall Skinner. And if you use the code CHANGEAGENTS10, that's going to net you 10% off of your first order. Again, my personal favorite blade is the Speed Goat. If they have them in stock right now, don't mess around. Put it in your cart and complete the checkout. Montana Knife Company, they build working knives for working people. And like I said at the beginning, I could not be more proud to collaborate with them on Change Agents Season 2. One thing I think that they're smart with or calculated with, if they hit you with the Xenu story on day one, that would be a problem. It's not as if yeah. that's the oh, day yeah. one. The, it, then I would fall back on you would probably have to be pretty dumb to fall for that if that was your first sure. pitch. But sure. like you said, $300,000 in and probably multiple years later, you get exposed to that incrementally over time. The trying to improve the world philosophy, I can understand how that's appealing to people. Improving yourself, of course, what's wrong with that? Um, but you know, in addition to you being the vice mayor and the chairman, you're also an, an award-winning journalist. So there's their pitch can you talk to me a little bit about the abuses, though, that you have reported on over the years, which is a counterpoint to their pitch of improving the world? Well, um, you know, Lisa McPherson was one of the major things we're talking about. But uh, as far as um, how the organization operates, it is a mind control factory. And uh, every member, whether you're uh, in the Sea Org where you sign a billion year contract to work for Scientology in exchange for 50 bucks a week. And you're crammed into an apartment with, um, you know, three triple bunk beds and you, you got tons of roommates in this tiny space that really can't handle it. Um, your, your life is devoted to working long hours, six days a week for Scientology and studying L. Ron Hubbard's words. Uh, whether you're that person or you're Tom Cruise. Um, Scientology is the same for everyone. It's the same tech that you're supposed to be dealing with. And this mind control factory is really insidious. When you get in, you'll normally get in through um, a stress test. Uh, uh, when you meet somebody on the street, um, uh, they'll say, you know, why don't you sit down here and talk about something that's giving you a problem and they'll put you on the e-meter and they'll find out what your, your, you know, is troubling you. And they say, well, uh, why don't you come on over here? We can help you with that problem. And they'll sign you up for what's called the communication course normally where they teach you how to, um, how, how to uh, listen and respond as a Scientologist. And the first course is not terribly expensive. You're surrounded by happy, bubbly people who think, isn't this, they're, they're bombarding you with, uh, isn't this wonderful? Oh my God, wait till you take the next course and the next course. 
and you get more and more isolated. Um, and each step of the way, and this is one of the truly insidious things that Hubbard came up with. After every course, you have to sit down and write up your win. So at the end of the communication course, you have you write you put in writing, I learned how to communicate better because of this. Uh, and then when you start to have doubts down the line, they will say, they will pull out all those, uh, 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 all your, your folders and say, look at all the wins you've had. You don't want to give up now because, you know, the next course is really going to, going to help you enormously. And when you have a doubt on, on what happened in this course where you were promised you'd be able to do a certain thing, and that hasn't happened yet, they say, uh, uh, that's explained in the next course. Uh, and with those blinders on, you just keep moving forward. Uh, and, and those blinders are, uh, are really insidious in themselves. Uh, they do what's called sec checks, security checks on an e-meter. Uh, and they'll ask you, uh, questions like, have you ever had a negative thought about L. Ron Hubbard? And if you had, if that shows up on the meter, well, <laughs> you you have a lot of work to do to get yourself back in the good graces. And they're going to explain to you how you're mistaken that Hubbard uh, uh, was right on this topic. Or if you have doubts uh, on another thing, uh, they can say, well, here's what Hubbard wrote about it. Uh, and you find that you put the blinders on because if you don't uh, do that, your doubts are going to be showing up on, on the e-meter, and you're going to have to spend a lot of money to go through extra auditing to solve that situation. So you start to close yourself off to say, well, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear anything negative. I don't want to see anything negative. It's working for me, and that's all I need to know until it doesn't work for them, until there's some situation where, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, somebody, uh, you have to disconnect from somebody in your family, a wife uh, and a husband may be forced to, to disconnect because one of them has doubts and Scientology will say, dump them. I I've interviewed people like that. There's a married couple of dentists in uh, in Chicago they got in through a um, a Hubbard management seminar where the Scientology isn't mentioned at all uh, it's a, a way for these people to go and talk to chiropractors and dentists and people like that who don't have any business training doctors do medical doctors get some training in how to run an office uh, through their education but uh, dentists and chiropractors don't. So Scientology says, ah, we know how to run your business and help you make money. Oh, interesting. They sign up for that course. Then they start to, to hire Scientologists to staff the, uh, the dentist office. These people then on staff know exactly how much money the dentists are making. So they report back to Scientology. So they know how much to suck out of them. And Scientology's whole business uh, system, whether it's Scientology itself or what they teach these, these people in the management companies is hard sell, uh, for the dentist, it, you know, they don't need to have this procedure done now. Well, they're going to need to have it done at some point, sell it to them now, sell everything now. Um, and at some point, that's going to ricochet back and bite you in the ass because your your customers are, are going to start to go, well, wait a minute. I, you know, I can't afford this. Um, but in, uh, until they've bled those customers dry and Scientology's managed to bleed the dentist dry, um, uh, Scientology is sitting pretty. Uh, that's not a, a, a good business model for the long term but it does cause a lot of damage in people's lives. Um, 
I, I don't know that I'm necessarily answering your question. No, you are. I, my, you know, a follow on question from that would be how much of that structuring this like a business, looking at it through the lens of financial, how much of that do you think comes from L. Ron Hubbard and how much of it do you think comes from Miscavige? Oh, uh, everything's from Hubbard. Miscavige, you think he's just have... he's just playing his game. He's just playing out the template that L. L. Ron Hubbard had created. Yeah, but the thing is, when when Hubbard uh, released a, a, a new level uh, on the bridge, and people would come up and say, um, I, "I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure that I'm I'm getting what I'm supposed to get from this." Hubbard had the advantage of being able to say, "Ah." but I'm working on the next level right now, and that's going to handle it. So he could always write something new. Um, and he was continually coming up with new policies, new levels, and new courses. Miscavige can't do that because Hubbard is the source. Mm -hmm. So uh, what Miscavige can only do is repackage things and do the hard sell to say, um, well, we found a lot of mistakes in the previous publications. There were a lot of missed commas. There were sentences that were put in the wrong spot. We've gone and we've republished everything. And you now have to buy a whole new set of, of books. You have to buy three sets. So you have one and uh, you, you can sell a couple others uh, to friends and family. Um, so they'll believe people drive that way. Um, and, and and there's always the push to raise money for a new building uh, uh, to um, fill the coffers to fight evil suppressive persons like me. Um, so they're, they're, there's they're constantly being regged. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's what they call their sales force registrars. And when you get regged, you're you're you know put put in a room and not let. Uh, not allowed to leave until you've uh, uh, given them the money that they want. There was one woman that that we interviewed back in 2000, a German woman, uh, no, Italian, I'm sorry, named uh, Maria Pia Gardini. Her daughter got into Scientology and she had a drug problem. And Scientology said, we can handle that. The mom then uh, joined Scientology, even though her, her, her daughter died from a drug overdose. And Scientology said, we can help you with your grief. This woman was, uh, you know, a millionaire, but she signed a, a, a billion year contract to work uh, and live in poverty. And every week, the uh, Thursday mornings, they would take her down to uh, a windowless room in the Fort Harrison, lock her in there with a reg and demand that she write another check for $10,000. Even though she was working for 50 bucks a week for them, she couldn't get out of that room until she wrote another check. This, you know, this is a, an evil corporation. They, they bled her dry. Um, and then the, the woman who was her reg showed up one day in a fancy new sports car that um, she was able to buy through the, the, um, the money she made on commissions. Scientology is not a religion. It's a religiously themed business where people get commissions off of donations to the church. They, um, they should be taxed uh, taxed like a business, they should lose that tax exempt status. And we're certainly uh, working, all of us who are critics of Scientology are working to, to make that happen. Uh, it's getting somebody in, in Congress to pay attention. That's the hard part to get some hearings done to, to get this open. But uh, the politics have been so wacky for so many years now in this country that we don't have time to concentrate on real problems, let alone get someone to pay attention to Scientology. So we continue just to educate the public and try to move forward that way. 
it's a little bit of a tough ask as well for policymakers. Not that they should avoid tough asks, but the organization has such a history of being aggressive and litigious. If you look at how they got the yeah. tax exempt status to begin with, what was it? Over a thousand lawsuits naming individual IRS agents. They yep. they come at you with a tsunami of individuals and information. I can understand from a policymaker perspective, like, oh, I do not want to deal with this. But I personally, and again, I'm not an expert on religion at all, from my view, I'm not understanding the tax-exempt status either. And do you think that the organization would survive if it was stripped of that, or would that be the death stroke? Uh, well, it would probably survive, but it would not survive the way it is now. They, you know, they've got a couple billion in the bank. They were almost bankrupt before they got the tax exempt status in the mid mm-hmm. um they don't deserve to uh, to have that exemption which is uh harming uh, well it's harming clearwater because we don't we don't get the 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 tax money here that we should have to to fix up our downtown to fight back against Scientology um you know, there, there's better uses for uh, for the tax dollars than Scientology is putting to use in their organization, uh, and it's it it's kind of cruel that the government um, allows this to happen. Where would you point somebody who is relatively unfamiliar or totally unfamiliar with Scientology? What what resources would you point them towards to educate themselves? Good Lord. Uh, nowadays, the, there's an entire world of information out there. Um, you know, my favorite book is, is uh, as I mentioned, Russell, uh, Russell Miller's Barefaced Messiah. But uh, watch Going Clear. Uh, watch Leah Remini, Scientology in the Aftermath. That's where you're going to get the most basic understanding of how Scientology operates, and then tell your friends about it. Tell them, hey, do you ever sit down and, and, and watch? I mean, this is astonishing, these stories. You know, you meet the people who have been through this, who have faced disconnection, who have had situations like Aaron, where his twin brother commits suicide over this, and yeah, family yeah. members are disconnecting. And it's like... Really? Uh, can't we do something about this? Um, and the more people find out, uh, the more fascinating the story it is, and the more the word spreads. And spreading that word is, I, I think, the best thing that anyone can do. You know, share what you know. Uh, and, and that makes a huge difference. Hope everybody enjoyed this week's episode. If you want to learn more about Mark Bunker and what he's up to and his efforts to expose the allegations against the Church of Scientology, you can follow his YouTube channel at Xenu TV on YouTube. Thank you again for listening to Change Agents, an ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company. We'll see you next week with an all-new episode.